Okay, can, can you hear me? Another day, another dollar, right? So we will pick up where we left off on Monday and uh, start with a brief review of the topics that we emphasized on Monday. Remember we talked about the patterns of natural selection and we mentioned that there were several and th this is just a kind of a straightforward effort to make a classification of the different ways that natural selection might work. So this is a, a human intellectual construct that we're imposing on the way the natural world works. So we divided natural selection up into a series of different possibilities. One is heterozygous advantage. We talked about heterozygous advantage in the context of the HLA genes. Remember we did a test to see whether there was a, using the Hardy-Weinberg law, to see whether there was an excess of heterozygotes at the HLA locus, a locus which is very important in human disease resistance. It's a fundamental part of the in, immune system in humans. And we found that that was the case, that heterozygotes did have an advantage. And we, and we, we used that to make an important point, and that is that if heterozygotes are favored over the different homozygous classes, then the long-term effect is to maintain genetic diversity in the population because heterozygotes contain both of the two alternative genes. So if there's heterozygous advantage, the end effect is going to be to maintain genetic diversity in the population rather than leading to the fixation of a favored gene. And we talked about directional selection and we looked at the way it would operate on a frequency distribution. That's where you take one extreme, let's say the right hand extreme of the frequency distribution because those individuals possess a trait which is favored in a particular environment. We saw an example in the first lecture when we talked about human selection for high levels of protein in corn seeds and maize seeds. So directional selection leads to the fixation or loss of alleles because it's favoring the more extreme types. Okay, pretty obvious. Uh, Another example was stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection is just where the two tails of the distribution are removed. For some reason, being at an extreme in the distribution is a disadvantage. We used a, a particularly interesting example, which is in your textbook. That's an example of human birth weight. It turns out that the highest level of survival for human infants, this is based on a study that was done in England a number of years ago, but the highest level of survival is at, a, at about seven and a half pounds birth weight. Babies of much higher birth weight have a higher mortality, so do babies of lower birth rates. That's an example of stabilizing selection. The two extremes are disadvantaged relative to the intermediate type. And then we talked about what is essentially the complement of stabilizing selection, it's disruptive selection, where the class in the middle, the types near the mean, are dis have a disadvantage, and there's actually selection against the intermediate type the extreme types, both extreme types are favored. And we saw a particular example of that in the case of birds which feed off two different sizes of seeds. So their environment includes two discreetly, discrete and fairly different resource classes and they adapt on one or on the other, but the middle, the median phenotype has a disadvantage. It's not adapted to either of those two resource types. So it's an example of disruptive selection. 
We then went on to talk about the f other forces of evolution. Natural selection is clearly the most important. It is the force that leads to adaptation to environments. Um, but there are other causes of gene frequency change in populations. And by the way, we introduced uh, allele frequency change as the fundamental definition of evolution. Simply changes in the frequency of heritable material over time, regardless of whether it's adaptive. So aside from natural selection, there is genetic random drift, and we discussed genetic random drift. It's just the random sampling of genes to transmit to the next generation. We talked about migration of genes between populations. <clears throat> if we have two populations which are different and genetic migration occurs between them, it will make them more similar. So it leads to changes in gene frequencies in both of the recipient populations. And finally, uh, we talked, well, on, under, let me just go back to genetic random drift. We talked about two special cases of genetic random drift. One is a founder effect, and we use the example of the mutineers from the bounty who colonized Pitcairn Island in the Pacific, which otherwise was not inhabited. And this small founder group, by virtue of simply being a small sample of the original population, deviated to some extent genetically from the parent populations. We also talked about bottleneck effects. A bottleneck is simply what the name implies. It's where the population size goes through a constriction. And as an example, I talked about the impact of the bubonic plague on Europe that restricted the population size. We talked about the most, the most serious, devastating episode of the plague was in the period uh, around 1348-1349 when roughly half the population of France perished. Big collapse in population size. I mentioned that it took about 150 years for the population to grow back to the size it had been prior to the plague epidemic. But <clears throat> Something that restricts population size makes the drift effect larger, so a population bottleneck will enhance the drift effect. I also mentioned that humans actually are believed to have gone through a substantial population bottleneck early after the colonization of, of Europe and Asia. And it's not clear what the causes were, but we can use genetic techniques to calculate backwards and ask what the population size might have been at its minimum. And the global population at its minimum for humans was probably around 10,000. And even though this occurred perhaps 50,000 years ago, the genetic signature is still with us and humans actually do not have as much genetic variation as many other species because we went through this extreme bottleneck early in the history of the human species. Again, we talked about gene flow. Finally, we talked about mutation, the ultimate source of all genetic variation. New genes have to arise by mutation. And there are lots of different kinds of mutation. The most common one we think about is where one base in the nucleotide sequence is replaced by a different one, a C for a T, A for a G. But there are also bigger mutations. There are mutations where whole genes are deleted or duplicated. There are mutations where transposable elements, pieces of DNA which are capable of jumping to different locations, insert in a gene and disrupt it. So there are many different kinds of mutations. We're going to talk later in this lecture about a specific kind of mutation which causes the doubling of the entire genome in the context of what's called polyploidy. So the mutation is the ultimate source of all genetic variation.
So uh, today we're going to pick up on the themes that we've developed so far. We're going to talk about non-random mating. You know, we emphasized random mating and the fact that the Hardy-Weinberg law, which can be deduced for random mating and tells us what the genotype frequencies will be, is really important for two reasons. The first is that it proves that gene frequencies do not change under random mating and therefore mating, the way mating system is not an evolutionary force. The other thing it proved was that there's a conservation of genetic variants. Now we're going to look at a couple of exceptions. One exception is inbreeding. We're going to consider the situation of inbreeding and then we're going to consider a different exception which is called sexual selection. So we're going to relax this random mating assumption and ask what happens if we allow for other possibilities in the world of evolution. Well, what is inbreeding? Inbreeding is simply where individuals mate who are more related than would be the case in a genetic sense, a genealogical, in a family sense, more related than would be the case if we drew mates randomly from the population. And inbreeding occurs in human populations. Uh, typically, the sort of most extreme level of inbreeding in human populations is first cousin matings, but they're not uncommon in some cultures. Um, the, it, a very extreme example in human history is that the Egyptian royalty practiced brother-sister mating, which is a very extreme form of inbreeding. And so we'll see what the consequences of inbreeding are. But let me just say at the outset that what we're going to discover is that inbreeding by itself does not change gene frequencies. So it's not going to cause by itself an evolutionary change. So that's a key fact. What inbreeding does do is change the distribution of genotype frequencies. And to see that, we're going to consider a simple example. It is the most extreme form of inbreeding, and that's self-fertilization. Now, many plants practice self-fertilization. Both the male and female reproductive structures are born within every flower and many plants, and that allows for the possibility of self-fertilization. In fact, 70% of all of the grasses self-pollinate. So self-fertilization is actually a very important mechanism for reproduction in a big part of the plant world. But what happens? Well, to see what happens under self-fertilization, let's divide the population up into three genotypes. And we'll look within each genotype to ask what the consequences are. Because if it's self-fertilization, it's one individual mating with itself, one genotype mating with itself. So we can use this device to analyze the consequences of self-fertilization. So let's consider the genotype A1A1. What happens, it, what kinds of progeny does it produce if it self-fertilizes? Only A1A1. Those are the only genes the A1 individual can transmit, the A1A1 individual can transmit to its offspring, right? So all of the offspring from that genotypic class flow into a1, A1 in the next generation. Same situation for the other homozygote, A2, A2. If, we, if it's a self-fertilization, an individual who is A2, A2 can only transmit A2, A2 genes to its offspring. So all of its offspring are going to have to be A2, A2. So the only case we really need to look at is the heterozygous case, A1, A2. Well, that's simple. We draw A1, we draw an A1 egg, let's say, with probability one half, right? 
A1 sperm with probability one half. So the product of the two is one fourth. So one fourth of the time we produce A1, A1 homozygotes from self-fertilization within the heterozygous class. So in the next generation, one fourth of the frequency of the heterozygous class is going to flow into the A1A1 class. And likewise for the other homozygote. The heterozygous class, we can draw A1A2 two ways. A1 egg, A2 sperm, A2 egg, A1 sperm. That can happen one fourth plus one fourth or one half of the time. So the number of heterozygotes in the next generation is 50% of what it was in the previous generation. Okay, that's it. Now we should be obvious if we do this again, the same things happen in the next generation. So once again, the frequency of heterozygotes is halved. So the frequency of heterozygotes under pure self-fertilization goes down at the rate of one half per generation. Well, what's one half to the, I don't know, to the tenth, say? Does anybody know? We have any, anybody who can do the calculation? I think it's 1,032, one over 1,032. So if we have 10 generations of self-fertilization, we have reduced that class more than a thousand fold. There are virtually no heterozygotes left in the population. It is only homozygotes. Have the gene frequencies changed? No. They're still the same. The gene frequencies have not changed, but the genotype frequencies have the homozygous genotype frequencies have grown till they're almost the entire population. The heterozygous genotype frequencies have diminished under self-fertilization. That's the most extreme form of inbreeding. But the consequences are the same for milder forms of inbreeding, like say first cousin matings in the human population. So inbreeding causes a reduction in the frequency of the heterozygous class, an increase in the frequency of the homozygous classes, but it does not change gene frequencies. It's a good test question, so you should remember that, okay? Um, now, there's an interesting consequence, though, which does relate to natural selection, and that is, I mentioned before that most mutations are deleterious. Because if you have a random mutation in a gene, changing an amino acid and an important functional protein randomly, the chances are that you're going to alter the function of the protein in a way which is less efficient than was originally the case. So most mutations are deleterious. And uh, most mutations in a diploid organism, most deleterious mutations, are found only in the heterozygote. Why? Because they're at a low frequency. Whenever they become homozygous, they're selected out because they're deleterious. Well, what's the consequence of inbreeding with respect to these deleterious mutations? It increases the frequency of recessive homozygotes for deleterious mutations. And those get selected out, okay? So there is an interaction between inbreeding and natural selection, which tends to reduce the frequency of deleterious mutations drifting in a population, because it increases the frequency of homozygotes where the deleterious mutation is exposed. Now, <clears throat> What are the health consequences, for example, in humans? Well, this table is a table which is in your book, um, and it looks at several different human populations. It looks at uh, the survival of children from first cousin marriages, okay? And these are from different historical epochs. So 
Children under 20 in the 18th and 19th centuries, the deaths among first cousin children of first cousin marriages versus non-related marriages, marriages among non-related individuals, 17% versus 12%. This was in the 17th and 18th century when child mortality was quite high, but it was still higher in the among the children of first cousin marriages because of the exposure of deleterious recessive mutations that in many cases were lethal, okay? Well, children under 10 in the United States from 1920 to 1956, mortality among first cousin, children of first cousin marriages, 8.1 versus 2.4. In, non, in marriages among non-related individuals, and so forth. Um, in France, 14 versus 10. Uh, Japan, 48 to 54, 5.8 versus 3.5. Uh, children aged one to eight in Japan from 48 to 54, 4.6 versus 1.5. So there's a pretty significant increase in mortality among children from first cousin marriages owing to the interaction between inbreeding and the selection against deleterious recessive mutations. Okay. Is, that all, is that obvious to everybody? Yeah. I don't get much feedback. <laughs> it's hard to tell. So sexual selection. Now sexual selection is different. Yes? Would that be kind of selection? I can't hear you. Would that be disruptive selection? Would it be? Disruptive selection? Mm. What type of selection would it be? No, because disruptive selection is taking out both extremes of the frequency distribution. So this is directional selection. It's selecting against specific mutations. But the fact that they're, uh, that the frequency of the recessive homozygote is higher means that selection is more effective at reducing those. So thank you for the question. Um, so sexual selection. Now the difference with sexual selection is that it, it can change gene frequencies. And there's, <clears throat> what is sexual selection? Well sexual selection is when individuals with particular heritable traits have a greater advantage in obtaining mates, okay? And there's a fundamental asymmetry to sex, which makes sexual selection quite important. And that is that, that females in most animal species invest a lot more in producing eggs and in possibly rearing young than do males who produce a vastly larger amount of sperm. So there's a fundamental asymmetry which leads to different investment strategies on the part of the two sexes. For, for females, it's Im important to select males who, have, who are of high genetic quality, if they can do that, so that the offspring that they invest time in caring for have the best opportunity of surviving because the male parent was good. So that's a female choice. There's, there's another consequence and that is that for males, um, the strategy is to compete for mates. So that causes male competition for mates and we'll see an example of that. Now with regard to the question of investing in higher quality mates, there's a kind of an interesting experiment which is described in your book and this has to do with finches which actually where female choice operates and apparently what happens is that the female finches can perceive the sort of genetic and health quality of potential mates based upon the color of their beak, uh, the intenseness of the color in the uh, color of the feathers, the intenseness of the color of the feathers, 
a healthy male, which has had a good diet, has usually had a diet which is high in carotenoids, okay? Carotenoids have an orangish pigment, and that actually, the carotenoids in the diet affect the pigmentation of the feathers in the beak. So uh, the group of researchers did experiments where they took males which were otherwise identical. One group was fed a diet which was supplemented with carotenoids and the other was not, okay? And then they were used in replicate experiments where females were allowed to choose between males that had been given carotenoids and those that had not, and the females chose the males with the supplemented diet. So that's an example of female choice based on physical characteristics which are believed to be surrogates for uh, sort of genetic quality of the male. Another concern is of course the amount of resources the male might be able to provide in terms of food and also uh, potentially uh, quality of parental care for offspring. So this experiment was done with zebra finches and I've just described it. Now let, let me describe briefly an experiment, an observational experiment on male-male competition. Here um, the subject is elephant seals. These are big, big animals, and, and the elephant seals, when the <coughs> female is ready to mate, crawl up on the beach, and they're not able to get up a steep beach, it has to be a, a modest slope, sandy beaches, and mating takes place on the beach, and offspring are actually born on the beach, and the males, compete by fighting to hold territories. So uh, a male who is large and aggressive and can beat the other males can hold a larger territory and therefore uh, can mate with a larger number of females on these restricted beaches which don't have a lot of space. So this is male-male competition for mates <clears throat> based upon territory. And here's a picture of two of the male elephant seals. They actually hit each other and bite each other. Um, size matters. The bigger you are, the more likely you are to win. And as a consequence, secondary sexual characteristics in males that favor being large and effective in this aggressive display are favored by natural selection. And the males are actually, because of this, they're four times larger than the, than the females. And some of them weigh as much as 27, 270 kilograms, I guess, more than almost, almost 1,000 pounds. These are really large animals, four times as large as the females. Now you can ask, well, What's the variation of reproductive success of, in males? And that's plotted here. The x-axis shows the number of offspring. This is the frequency distribution by male. So you see most males are in the zero class. They don't produce any offspring at all. And then there's just a small number of males way out at the right hand end of the distribution who are producing most of the offspring for the next generation. If you look at female reproductive success, it's quite different. The distributions are quite different. All right. So this is another form of sexual selection. Now the thing that's, um, the thing that's important is that this is a form of selection. It changes Gene frequencies favors the evolution of larger, more aggressive males. But there's another consequence that you might think about, uh, which is not mentioned in your book, and that is that if almost all of the next generation is fathered by just a handful of males, which is what this suggests, what does that mean for genetic drift? 
means that genetic drift should be more important because you're sampling genes from a very small subset of the male population to transmit it to the next generation. So this also has a consequence in terms of genetic drift. So what are the consequences of sexual selection? Well, I've just mentioned them. Sexual dimorphism, that is uh, the emphasis of traits which differ between the two sexes. Another you know, great example is the peacock with its wonderful display. Good example of sexual selection, in this case, female choice. Uh, so sexual dimorphisms that differ between males and females. And the second important consequence is it violates the assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg law. It is a form of natural selection and leads to the increase or decrease of, of alleles in population. So that's sexual selection. Now, now we're gonna turn to um, a different topic and that's the topic of speciation. So, so far we've talked about the mechanisms of evolution, but we have not talked about how species arise. And one of the ironies of uh, Darwin's book, which was published in 1859, and in fact, uh, it was amazing, the book sold out, the entire first printing sold out on the day it appeared because the world was ready for these ideas at, at that time. But the title of the book was on, was Origin of Species. And yet, the book doesn't really talk about origin of species. It talks about natural selection. Now, natural selection is the mechanism behind the origin of species, but Darwin really didn't focus on that connection. He focused on the fact that he was presenting a mechanism for evolutionary change and adaptation through time. So we're gonna ask how do species actually arise? Now, maybe the first thing we ought to ask is, is the idea of species a reasonable one? Is this just a, a human construct that we've imposed on the outside world because it's convenient for us to classify things? Well, that's certainly a possibility. But if, if we take different forms of life and we, we measure each populations of each forms and then we, we plot those on some sort of a multi-dimensional graph, we see that we end up with groups of clusters. There are, all humans are similar, okay? And they're different in very distinctive ways from other animals, even from ones that they're closely related to, like chimpanzees, we have no trouble distinguishing humans from chimpanzees. We're different in a wide variety of morphological traits. So there seems to be an objective reality behind the idea of a species. But we want to get at the sort of underlying bases for that reality in this lecture. But before I do that, I'd just like to say you, you probably learned in high school biology that there are other higher levels of classification. In fact, when I was a student, there was a little litany you had to learn. It was phylum class order family genus species. And uh, now we have domain on top of that. So domain phylum class order family genus species. It turns out that the only one of that hierarchy of classifications that we can really define objectively in, in genetic terms is species. Now we'll look later in the course when we look at the things that have distinguished the major steps in the evolution of plants and animals at some of these big characteristics. But, but the difference between a family and an order is arbitrary. That's not really true for species. So why is that? How do we define species? Well, fundamentally, populations become two different species and therefore evolutionarily independent entities when they are no longer able to exchange genes. So that what happens in the evolutionary future of one species 
is unrelated to what happens to the evolutionary future of the other species after they have separated. So the key element in the definition of species is genetic isolation or the reduction in gene flow between populations of different species. That is the genetic isolation is the key element. And so we're going to look at different ways that that happens. And then we're also going to look at different practical ways that biologists actually use to identify different species. So speciation creates two or more distinct species from a single ancestral group. That's this assumption of common descent. At some point they split and there's a point beyond which they can no longer exchange genes. And there's two different ways broadly that that might happen. One, one is called prezygotic isolation and the other is called post-zygotic isolation. And I'll come to those again in a moment, but this picture just taken from your book illustrates the morphological differences between two different populations of medium ground finch found in the Galapagos Islands on different islands. They colonized different islands over time accumulated mutational differences, adapted to different vegetation sources on the different islands to the point where eventually, if you brought them back together, they could not exchange genes. They're different species. It's a slow process. Now, there are three different approaches that biologists use to identifying species. One is called the biological species concept. That, in, that emphasizes this tests that show that they are genetically isolated, that they can't exchange genes. One is called the morphological species concept. That simply emphasizes all of the ways in which the populations might differ in morphology. And one is for, called the phylogenetic species concept, which emphasizes changes that have arisen since a common ancestor. So the biological species concept, I, I just I mentioned that it's dependent on them not being able to interbreed in absence of gene flow. And I said that there are two kinds of ways that gene flow might be blocked. One is prezygotic. What does prezygotic suggest to you? A blockage before the union of gametes to form a zygote. And the other is postzygotic. Gametes unite, an offspring is produced, but for, it doesn't survive. Postzygotic, okay? Two different ways, and a fair amount of energy has been put into looking at these different mechanisms. So, first, prezygotic. Prezygotic isolation, as I've said, occurs when individuals are prevented from mating. This can happen a lot of different ways. It can happen behaviorally. It may be that, that the behavioral differences, and we see this a lot in insects, for example, have evolved differently between the two populations that prevents intermating. It may be that um, they become reproductively active at different times of day, even though they're in the same space. That's a prezygotic isolating mechanism. Postzygotic. They've mated, but the hybrid offspring have low fitness. Now, a big problem with the biological species concept is that this, these ideas are fine, but they're difficult to operationalize. In most cases, it's hard to do the tests and see whether they're actually, whether there is a prezygotic or a postzygotic barrier to genetic exchange or not. And it's impossible almost, although we'll look at an exception, it's almost impossible to do this for fossils or for asexual organisms. So there are cases where we just can't apply this test at all because it's just not feasible. But here's a nice exception. I mentioned yesterday Neanderthals in humans, the lineage 
that led to Neanderthals and humans is thought to have separ separated in Africa about 800,000 years ago. Neanderthals the populations migrated northwards and arrived in Europe, it, the distribution is shown here, uh, and, and parts of the Middle East and South Asia somewhere between 350 and 600,000 years ago. We don't know precisely because there have been several intervening episodes of glaciation which have destroyed much of what would have been the fossil record. So, but, but certainly by 300,000 years ago, Neanderthals were in Europe and parts of Asia. And that was <clears throat> before modern Homo sapiens had actually emerged in southern Africa. The last Neanderthal settlements that we know of were about 25,000 years ago around Gibraltar. Something happened and the Neanderthals population moved towards extinction and it became extinct about 25,000 years ago. So here's an extinct case. Now were Neanderthals a different species from humans? Well, it, based on what I told you in the last lecture, we can actually do the test because it's now possible to get from the rare Neanderthal remains that we're able to look at some fragments of DNA and it has been possible to sequence the whole Neanderthal genome in several cases, not just one. And of course we've got now many sequences of the human genome and so we can ask, are there Neanderthal genes in the human genome? And the answer is yes, about one to four percent of our genes, particularly those of us who have a European ancestry, are Neanderthal. Pretty amazing. So here, what would you say? Would you say Neanderthals were a different species or a subspecies of Homo sapiens? Well, it looks like they could interbreed. So by the biological species concept, we would have to say that Neanderthals were a subspecies of Homo, not a different species, right? And so this is a kind of an interesting exercise in applying this biological species concept. What about the morpho-species concept? Well, let me just go back and look at Neanderthals again. This panel on the left actually shows the, a, a reconstruction of a Neanderthal individual by an artist, a forensic artist, but the, one of the things that is of interest is how do the Neanderthals differ from humans? Well, from Homo sapiens, from sapiens, us. And they differed in a number of ways. They had bigger chests, rounder body, shorter legs, very much, they were stronger. They had a larger cranium and probably a larger brain than modern humans. The bigger body size and shorter appendages was probably an adaptation to cold because they lived through these glacial periods in northern climates and it may have been the onset of warmer periods that helped lead to their extinction, although another hypothesis is that their cousins, Homo sapiens sapiens, helped wipe them out as well and we don't really know what the truth is. But we can look, we can measure morphological traits and use those as a surrogate for genetic differentiation. Right, if they're morphologically different, some of that is probably determined by genes and so we can define species based upon sufficient morphological differentiation and use that as a surrogate to assume that there's enough genetic differentiation. This is the morpho-species concept. Now the problem with the morpho-species concept is that it's, you know, it's somewhat subjective. It depends on what you decide to measure, what you think is important as a, a surrogate for genetic discontinuity between the two groups. But this is the thing that's been applied by taxonomists for most of time because it's the thing you can do most easily. You can measure and it's certainly what we use almost entirely in uh, looking at fossil species. We have to identify them based on their morphologies. Now the final species concept is this phylogenetic species concept. 
And this is a more contemporary idea. It's based on the idea that um, we can reconstruct the evolutionary history of populations based on some sort of differences. Nowadays, frequently DNA-based differences. And there are a couple of pieces of terminology that come up in this area. One is the idea of a monophyletic clade. Well, monophyletic just means traces back to a single origin. So the tree of life that I showed you in the first lecture represents a monophyletic clade. Everything traces back to a single origin. But we can look at smaller subsets of the tree and ask if they appear to be monophyletic groups or clades. And an example from your book is actually elephants. It turns out there's three species of elephants. Now, the three species are depicted here, and the, the names, Indian, Sri Lankan, and so forth, represent different populations within, within, for example, the Asian elephant species and so forth. If we look at all three species, they form a monophyletic clade, as illustrated by the top panel. But there are distinct mutations that distinguish the African savanna elephant and the African forest elephant from the Asian elephant and group them more closely together than the Asian elephant. So they also are a monophyletic clade, okay? What is a species? A species is then just the smallest monophyletic clade on the tree. That's the definition of a species in this phylogenetic species concept. It's the smallest monophyletic group on the tree. Well, what's the problem with this method? Well, one problem is we don't have um, DNA sequences or other good measures from most species on Earth. So it's a conceptual idea, but not one we can apply in all cases, although we're getting more and more data and it will be easier and easier to apply it as time goes on. Subspecies. Well, we talked about subspecies when we talked about Neanderthals and humans. These are populations that might live in discrete geographic areas and they have their own identifying characteristics, bigger cranium, but um, they're not distinct enough to be separate species. Gene flow is possible as we saw between Homo sapiens sapiens and Neanderthals. And there's an example of subspecies uh, in the textbook uh, the seaside sparrow that lives along the Atlantic and Gulf coasts, and these are physically isolated from one another. And there was a lot of concern about the conservation of one of the six seaside, dusky seaside sparrows because it was going extinct. In fact, it got down to just six individuals um, who all were males, so the population was effectively at an end. Now, why would you worry about a subspecies? Well, in this case, one reason is that the Endangered Species Act actually mandates the a whole set of actions if a subspecies of a vertebrate animal is threatened. And so there was an effort to ask, are these really different? And that work was actually done by a guy here at, at UCI, John Avis, who's a, a great scientist. and. He looked at the DNA characteristics of the different species of seaside sparrows. There are six different named groups shown on that tree, but you can't distinguish the Atlantic coast ones from one another, okay? So if you see the different names, Martima, Machiavellia, Negressens, those three are not distinguishable, so they're actually not different subspecies. They're genetically the same. Likewise for the, for the uh, Gulf Coast ones, not distinguishable. So it's an example of applying practical technologies to asking these questions about species and subspecies. And I'll stop here and we'll pick up on Friday. Don't forget there's a quiz on Friday. Bring your clickers. <laughs>